What's going on YouTube? It's Teej back again with another video and today I'm giving you my run through the AFC South, the final division on the AFC side of our way too early 2022-2023 regular season record predictions. Hopefully you all enjoyed today's video. If you do, be sure to hit that like button. If you're new around here, want to help us get closer and closer to 1,000 subscribers and mean the world to me, you can do that by just hitting that big red subscribe button. And of course, join for a conversation down below in the comment section. I respond to just about every comment. How do you think this division shakes out one through four? Who takes home the division title? Love to have your thoughts down below in the comments section. So like I said, this is the last division, the AFC side of things. Go back and check out what our predictions are for the AFC East, North, and uh, West. But because of that, we already have a few games filled in, but we'll start off with the Tennessee Titans. Obviously, no AJ Brown, that's a big loss. If you're a Titans fan, you're hoping Traylon Burks can, I mean, pretty quickly, Filled in that production that's going to be lost, and you're hoping Robert Woods could add something that you were missing last year, and you're going to need that defense to be just as good as it was a season ago. Let's start out with a win week one against the Giants. I think they are, you know, further along, and I think the Titans, Titans, excuse me, a little more playoff competitive than where the Giants probably are, you know, barring a crazy step forward from Daniel Jones. So because of that, give me the Titans defense creating some turnovers and giving it a hard week one for Daniel Jones. We've already talked about weeks two and three. Go back and check out our prior videos for my rationale there get to our first uh in division matchup between uh the titans and the colts and this will in all honesty probably be a split series in my eyes so we'll go ahead and give the colts the home a win in week four then we have to fast forward and give the titans a win plus titans coming off a buy in week six that kind of makes sense so then we get to week five. Let me get Tennessee with a road win against the Washington Commanders. I think this is a Titans team that is probably going to be regressing compared to where they were last year, but still have talent on the, uh, on the field. So barring Carson Wentz really figuring out and having a big game there in week five, I like the Titans roster a little bit more than Washington. And, you know, I you know give Tannehill all his faults. He's not elite. He was disappointing in the playoffs last year but he's still you know a league average you know in that 14 to 16 14 to 18 quarterback range so because of that he is better than Carson Wentz I'll take the better quarterback in that matchup and I'm gonna have Tennessee taking this week eight matchup against the Texans you know the Texans are gonna be a little sneaky this year and especially in the division game I could see this being a road and road split so I'm going to do just that. That might be a little bold, but I think the Texans are starting to build some things, and especially as the year goes on, I think they'll get better and better. So kind of fills out with that philosophy. Let's give the Texans the second, uh, the win in the second matchup there in Week 16. And then the next game we'll talk about is we've already talked about Week 9 and 10. Uh, Titans versus the Packers, Thursday Night Football. I think the Packers are a better team. Plus, right home, the short week, I tend to be a little biased there towards the home team on Thursday Night Football games. Titans and Eagles, I'll take the Eagles at home. I think the Eagles... Not only a playoff team like they were last year. You know, I know the Titans were the number one seed in the AFC last year, but different teams. I think you know the Eagles got better. The Titans took a step back, and this is an AJ Brown revenge game. There's no way I'm taking the team that wouldn't pay the the, the premier wide receiver and then traded him away. I'll take the Eagles at home, and then I'll have the Titans. I'll go ahead and have Tennessee taking both games against the Jacks. Might flip that once we get later on in this video, but. Right now, I think the Titans are further along. I think the Jags still have a fair amount of issues to sort through. And I'll give the Cowboys a win in Week 17. And that puts Tennessee at 6-11 and 11 now. I understand that is extremely harsh. Mike Vrabel is one of the best coaches in the NFL. This defense still has talent. By the end of the year, we might be talking about Jeffrey Simmons as the best player in this division, which I know. Yeah, you know, DeForest Buckner still plays in Indianapolis. Darius Leonard's still a freak. That's how good Jeffrey Simmons is. I, you know... Given the lack of superstar talent there on the outside, barring Traylon Burks, immediately hits the ground running and has this Jamar Chase type of impact. You're talking about Robert Woods coming off a torn ACL and then not a whole lot else when it comes to the passing game. Derrick Henry was banged up last year. The interior of the offensive line has gotten worse. I think this Titans offense is going to struggle putting points on the board. You're going to really see Ryan Tannehill as who he is, someone who's dependent on having a good supporting cast. And, you know, I like Mike Fravor. I like that defense. 6-11 and 11 does make me feel like I'm on the low side of variance here. But I think this Titans team is in for a pretty sizable step back. And I think that will be the catalyst for moving on from Ryan Tannehill and kind of building it up from the ground once again. So, uh, yeah, disappointing there. I'm sure I will uh, make lots of Tennessee fans upset there. But let's move on to the Houston Texans. 
still probably one of the worst teams in the NFL. And if you saw my way too early power rankings, they're near the bottom. They still have a lot of holes in the roster, but they're starting to build an identity. And I'm excited to see, you know, what it all comes together looks like. Derek Stingley Jr. Loved that pick at three. Kenny Green might have been a little early at 15, but now we really get to see what a Nick Casario rebuild looks like. And Lovey Smith wasn't a necessarily inspired hire, but stable hand. He'll coach up the defense and, you know, do his best with what he can with young talent on the field. I'll have them start another year with a loss against the Colts, though. I just think Indianapolis is, you know, the best team in this division, which we'll talk about in a little bit, so I won't hit on it too hard here. Bears in Texas, I think these two teams are closer than what it might seem. Um, and, you know, given where, especially the wide receiver room is right now for Chicago, it's kind of tempting to think about, you know, Houston, you still got Brandon Cooks there, have some peace to Nico Collins with somebody I was intrigued by coming out of Michigan going into year two. We'll see what Davis Mills can, you know, orchestrate here. But Dustin Fields, my number three overall prospect, it would be a little foolish of me to not take Fields over Davis Mills, who was a third round pick in the same draft. So I'll go better quarterback plus the home team taking out uh, the Houston Texans there in week three. So it's an 0-4 start. And then I'll have Houston and Jacksonville split. Uh, you know, 0-5 feels pretty harsh. Uh, but these two teams, I think, are closer than, you know, it really needs to be. It's not a whole lot of a conversation to be had there. They're two of the worst teams in the league, and they're both needing more out of their second-year quarterback. Now, Lawrence has more expectations to come with that, but we'll, we'll talk about Jacksonville here in just a moment, so I don't want to you know, give away all my talking points there. But I think Houston-Jacksonville, pretty identical when it comes to being one of the worst teams in the NFL, and because of that, we'll have them have the road-in-road road split. By week, they lose the Raiders next week. That's unfortunate. The Raiders just, you know, huge... As much as I do like Derek Stingley, rookie cornerback, tasked with slowing down Devontae Adams. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take Devontae Adams in DFS that week. Uh, and then the Eagles, you know, I think the Eagles are just, like I said earlier, a playoff caliber team. And, you know, if things really come together well and Jalen Hurts takes a step forward, they might be even more than that. Maybe NFC, you know, championship game type of contenders if all breaks the right way. So I'll take the Eagles there. Uh, Texans and Giants, this is an interesting one, especially if you create some turnovers against Daniel Jones, get the ball back in the hands of Davis Mills. This might become, you know, possession by possession, you know, time management, who has the ball longer in their hand type of game. I think I'll still go with the Giants. I think their defense is a little further along, plus Wink Martindale. I like him as a defensive coordinator a lot more than Lovey Smith. That's not to knock and, you know, talk slander against Lovey Smith. But Wink Martindale's been one of the best in the game for a while. Lovey Smith feels like a product of, you know, the early odds, really, more than he is a defensive guru nowadays. So I'll take the Giants at home. But that one could be interesting. You get, you know, three turnovers out of Daniel Jones, and it'll be hard to see Houston lose that one. Let me get Houston in the Commanders, and I'll give Houston a, sc a win here. This team is not going to go open 17. They're going to win games. They're at home. I think the Commanders... You know, it's similar to what we were talking about with the Giants. You get a couple turnovers against a turnover-prone quarterback. Anything is live. So let's say the Giants get the best of the Texans, but then Houston's able to create those turnovers and take one from the Washington Commanders. I think one of those two games they'll end up winning, uh, and it makes a lot of sense because of, like I said, generate turnovers against a turnover-prone quarterback. I've already talked about Week 12, 13, 15, and 16, as well as 17. So Week 14, Week 18, the last two games we'll talk about. Um, it's really interesting to potentially talk about this Week 18 game with the Colts maybe splitting with Houston. Also, let's see where the record's at, 3-12. and yeah, That feels... Pretty close to right. I think there's still going to be some growing pains. Dallas is a better team, so we can go ahead and move on to week 18. I think the Colts are an imperfect squad, and as this team starts to build some progress and finds its identity, like we were talking about the week 16 win against Tennessee, especially once you see these up-and-coming teams steal some games that you're kind of surprised by. They tend to be in division, right? You always play your, your division foes a little closer. And let's just say two of the last three weeks of the year, the Texans were able to score some division wins and generate some positive buzz. Another offseason, if they spend money wisely and free agency and then have a good draft, I could see this team kind of being emerging as, I don't want to say a dark horse, but late season momentum, a good offseason, they could start to become a trendy team for the next Bengals, which... Obviously, that's going to be overblown and an exaggeration, but this team could carry that late, strong finish with a good offseason and maybe start to put together a 500-ish resume or a squad that could put together a 500-ish season. But that's just kind of where I'm thinking right now. This is obviously all way too early. So then we get to the Indianapolis Colts, and they're already 2-8. and eight. So 
this was kind of a tough draw here because I think this is the best team in the division. Spoiler alert, I'm going to probably have them winning the division here. But uh, they'll they'll take this game against the Jags. This would be like their first win in Jacksonville in like eight years or something like that. So that would be bonkers. And I'll go ahead and give them the uh, division sweep against the Jags. And I think the AFC South is one of the worst divisions in football. And you know, maybe you could sell, an, sell me on an argument that they are the worst division in football. Because of that, I think really where you'll see these teams separate is the Colts is the best team, and at least roster on paper when all is fully healthy compared to everyone else. They have the best quarterback in the division in my eyes. They have the best, you know, as much as I said, Jeffrey Simmons is the best, potentially best player in the division in a year's time. Right now, I think you would say Darius Leonard's probably the most, uh, you know, well-rounded and most impactful defensive player in the division, and DeForest Buckner is no slouch himself. So because of that, I think you'll start to see some differentiating points really come to rise once we get in the in-division setting. So we already talked about the, the good portion of this beginning schedule. I'll have uh, Matt Ryan scoring a win against uh, Carson Wentz, better quarterback, plus they're playing at home. Yeah, I'll take Carson Wentz there. I mean, excuse me, I'll take Matt Ryan there over Carson Wentz. Could not emphasize that. I'll take Ryan over Wentz any day of the week. Eagles and Colts, that's an interesting one. And Indianapolis has, you know, really stout defense and they can create turnovers. I think they'll be able to steal one of these two games uh, between the Eagles and the Cowboys. Honestly, I'm kind of thinking that the Eagles might be my pick to win the NFC East. We'll see once we get there. So let's have the Colts take down the Cowboys and let's have the Eagles steal one on the road. More often than not, you know, that the, the notion of home field advantage isn't all that strong. Unless you're getting into a specific place, like it's hard to play in Arrowhead. The Death Star seems kind of daunting. Heinz Field's always giving people issues. The terrain that comes with playing in Foxborough in December, you know, that can be challenging. I get all that. But for the most part, it's a 50-50 proposition, so I don't mind being kind of road heavy here, especially as we get further and further in the season. Scouting kind of reports are filling themselves out, so on and so forth. By week, I'll have the Colts taking down the Vikings in week 15. You know, this is a Minnesota team that has lots of veterans and a lot of players who are injury prone. And by week 15, more often than not, teams that are injury prone are battling a lot of injuries, which every team will be by that point. But, you know, let's say there's no Zadarius Smith and, uh, you know, no Daniel Hunter on the field. Who's generating pass rush? As much as I may concern specifically about the left tackle spot, unless Bernard Raymond is healthy. Otherwise, that feels like one of the best picks in the draft value-wise. There are reasons to be concerned about potentially, uh, you know, that pass protection for Matt Ryan. He is someone who is not necessarily all that mobile uh, and is quick to go down in the pocket. So if Bernard Raymond isn't healthy or maybe not ready to play right away, that could be a huge area of concern. But, you know, in this hypothetical situation, no Zadarius Smith, no Daniel Hunter. Hopefully they're out there, but let's just say they aren't. I mean, Matt Ryan's going to have all day to pick apart a secondary that is imperfect. So uh, I'll take the Colts picking up a win there on the road, and I'll have Indianapolis scoring a win as well against the Giants. I think they're just a better team. And that puts them at 8-9. We'll go ahead and flip this Houston game then and put them at 9-8. and eight. They'll be the lowest seed that, you know, wins. Uh, uh, they'll be the fourth seed, the highest or the lowest division winner. That's kind of a mouthful to say. Uh, and that also flips the Texans back to 3-14. and 14. So that could be in flux there, but I think the Colts can finish the year over 500. That, that's really why I go back and I change that. Let's talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'll have them losing to the Washington Commanders in week one. I, I don't think the Commanders are going to go 0-17 either, despite you know me not being thrilled about Carson Wentz. He does have some upside there, but Jacksonville, you know, you're going to need to scale a lot from Trevor Lawrence. And I think it's going to take some time. So was this an 0-5, 0-6 start that we're getting them off to? You know, I think the world of Doug Peterson in a lot of ways, because he is a Super Bowl winner and former NFL quarterback. He's had success working with quarterbacks. But at the same time, given all they had to do this offseason to improve their roster and how hard they worked to not fully get there, like it feels like one of these teams that with all the draft resources and cap space could have had an unreal offseason, something straight out of Madden, but... They're overpaying for a guard on the wrong side of third. I don't want to say overpaying, but they're spending a lot of money on a guard over their 30. They're overpaying Christian Kirk. They're overpaying Zay Jones. They're having to do all this because it's Jacksonville Jaguars. So because of their reputation, maybe they're overpaying free agents and it doesn't feel like they made as much progress as they could have if you're just looking at it in theory and on paper. Uh, so again, I think you're going to see some growing pains. And as much as I do like Doug Peterson, I think it's going to be pretty challenging out of the gate. 0-6 start feels a little little brutal. We'll have him win a game against the Giants. And I think the Giants, especially if Daniel Jones doesn't take that step forward, could be in for you know a tough season ahead, uh, especially that Wink Martindale scheme. We're relying on quarterbacks. You move on to James Bradbury. Bradbury. Dory Jackson's had his injury problems. I could see the secondary being a concern for them. We're not talking about the Giants, though. But I'll have the J 
Jags. Uh, 0-7 feels really harsh. I don't think this team's going to have the number one overall pick again. So got to get them some wins in there. And we've already run through this schedule. I mean, it's daunting, right? Having the AFC West when you're the AFC South is just not fair. So the Broncos, the Raiders, the Chiefs, they're all better. They're all better. The Ravens, they're better. So this middle part of the schedule is a bit of a gauntlet there for Jacksonville. Uh, let's have the Jags snag a win against the Lions. I'm not necessarily thrilled about that, but let's just say Trevor Lawrence tears it up. They get into a dome setting and have some success against you know a Lions defense that maybe is a little down that week. I like the pass rush that Detroit's putting together. The secondary, though, does have some holes, and maybe this is a big game for Trevor Lawrence playing inside that dome, like I said. Um, Jacksonville and Dallas, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Dallas is still a better squad, and I can give you a win over Detroit, despite me thinking the Lions are a better squad, but Dallas to Jacksonville, those rosters aren't really close to one another, despite Dallas, I think, in my eyes, taking a little bit of a step back, and I'll have the Jags taking, uh, taking home a win over the Jets. Back-to-back -back years where we see one versus two, Trevor Lawrence versus Zach Wilson in that 2021 draft. Uh, and let's, you know, you look at the end of the schedule, and I think there's some glimmers of hope, similar to what we talked about with, uh, with Houston, where a young team that is imperfect and has lots of holes, but starting to piece things together down the stretch, gives that fan base reason for hope. You're seeing three wins over the final you know, six games of the regular season. I think that's something that Jacksonville can then carry into the offseason, and maybe that shakes off the narrative a little bit and they can have a little bit more financial savvy uh, moves next offseason. Maybe moving on from Trent Bulky would help as well. That's just my take and another good draft. Maybe this team starts to piece together year two of Doug Peterson, year three of Trevor Lawrence. Maybe it then comes all together. But certainly this is going to be a team that struggles. There's a lot of holes and there's a lot of newness too, right? Like it's going to take time for everyone to get acclimated with Doug Peterson. Those systems have really come into place and, you know, Second year, different system for Trevor Lawrence. So there's going to be some growing pains there. But nonetheless, I think this team is going to be slightly more competitive. And if they're one of the worst teams in the league, they're still going to be relatively fun to watch. But long tangents aside, that's going to do it for my AFC South preview. Tell me what you think down below in the comment section. How do you think this division shakes out one through four? You can see it on the left side of your screen. I got the Colts as the division winner. Who do you think comes away with the AFC South crown this year? Hopefully you all enjoyed today's video and didn't mind my uh, long-winded tangents. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button. It helped me out a ton. If you're new around here, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button as we're getting closer and closer to 1,000 subscribers. That's going to do it for me. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. Until next time, my name is Tej, and I'm signing off.